Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we have to start with the unfortunate news that the Falcon Heavy core has been lost to the oceans. Apparently, heavy seas caused it to topple off of the barge. Now, normally the Falcon cores are held down by a, a robot called the Octagrabber. It's like a crab robot that kind of rolls underneath and holds the legs down. But there's been design changes between the Falcon Heavy and the regular Falcon 9, and the Octagrabber wasn't available. It didn't work with this design so it was lost to the high seas. That is at least the official story. I have an alternate theory, and there is nothing to disprove my idea that the driver of the barge simply didn't notice this very important sign on their route home. It is, of course, unfortunate because this is the second Falcon Heavy core they've lost. The first one, if you remember, did not light all of the engines in time, and so it couldn't stop. But moving on to the other thing that didn't stop on time, we've had some updates from uh, Bereshit, so the team has analysed what happened and they confirmed that due to uh, a command being sent to shut something down, that caused a cascading effect in various systems. I've seen some translations uh, from the team, you know, basically these are people that were listening in on the uh, control room and they explained all the stuff because of course they're all talking in Hebrew and I don't understand Hebrew, but I do understand some of these words about rockets. So yeah, it, it's kind of interesting to see them saying, oh, the engine is running, but look at the vertical speed. The engine is clearly not running. According to require top, main engine is not running. Like, no, the main engine is running. <laughs> like, check the acceleration. Main engine is currently not running. Oh dear. And that was the point, of course, at which it was too late. Even if they had started the engine at that time, they would have still hit the surface. But hey, one of the payloads has at least confirmed that although because they only hit at about one kilometer per second, it's entirely likely that a disk containing the contents of Wikipedia uh, it was relatively intact and is now scattered somewhere randomly on the moon, still in readable format. I've also he heard that one of the other payloads was uh, queso cheese, so there is now officially cheese on the moon. So that means the Cheesy Moon Society now officially has more evidence to support their case than the Flat Earth Society. But I did actually make one mistake. I said that this was the first commercial spacecraft to reach the moon, and one of the commenters came in and said, Hey, you forgot HGS-1, the first commercial lunar mission. And this is something I barely remembered, and I'm glad that this commenter came in and reminded me, and I will have to dig out the person's name, but thanks. But HGS-1 was actually a geostationary satellite that was launched on a proton rocket. It was originally called Asia Sat 3. This is actually Asia Sat 5, but importantly, it launches on a Proton K rocket with an extra DM3 upper stage. Now, it was going to a geostationary orbit, and launching out of Baikonur, that actually gives you a very high inclination of about 55 degrees. And of course, to go to a geostationary orbit, you need to bring that orbit all the way down as well as circularizing it. So initially, the spacecraft put the satellite into a highly eccentric orbit, with uh, the periaps being close to the Earth and the apoaps being out at geostationary orbit. And then, once it got out there, that upper stage, the DM3, was supposed to circularize it. Unfortunately, the engine shut down moments later, leaving the spacecraft stuck in an orbit which was essentially useless. So the insurance company paid out the original satellite operators, and in an effort to reclaim some of its money, it made an agreement with Hughes Corporation, who had built the satellite bus, saying, if you can recover some value from this, we will share the profits. To recover the spacecraft, they would have to circularize this orbit and remove as much inclination as possible. Now, without the big kick motor, they would have to do this using the small station-keeping thrusters, which didn't have the same fuel reserves, and they didn't have nearly as much thrust. So the plan was that they would progressively raise the orbit, make it more eccentric, uh, by burning at perigee, and then they would use a gravity assist or two from the moon. So this is a simulation. This data has come from the Horizon system that's available via JPL. You can download the XYZ coordinates for the spacecraft. And yeah, you can see in the top one, the eccentricity of the orbit is being kicked up. It's getting progressively higher over time. On the bottom, you can see the inclination of the orbit relative to the 
planet Earth. So now it gets one big kick and oh, here comes the moon and the moon is going to grab it and that's going to change the orbit quite significantly. The two main things that were changed was the perigee has been raised up but it hasn't been raised up far enough just yet but the inclination of the orbit is much more in Earth's plane. So we're going to have a second lunar encounter just coming up after this and that will raise the perigee far enough that they can then slow the spacecraft down into its geosynchronous orbit. So with this two encounter solution, they ended up um, putting it into a geosynchronous orbit. That meant that the orbital period was 24 hours, but they weren't able to remove all the inc inclination. So instead of being geostationary, it was simply geosynchronous, and that meant that it oscillated above and below the equator over time. They had managed to put the spacecraft out over Hawaii, and it would kind of sit and do this oscillation up and down. The spacecraft was sold to Pan Am Sat and became PAS-22, where it operated for a few years before finally uh, being moved to a graveyard orbit. And so in the process, it became the first commercial spacecraft to visit the moon. The original mission plan had it only visiting the moon once, but they realized that by having a second lunar encounter, it actually gave them more opportunities to correct errors that would inevitably creep into it. Because it wasn't just a case of, you know, firing the engines. They had to know where the spacecraft was, and it wasn't designed to maintain orientation when it was that far out. There were alternate trajectories suggested by other individuals, but those wouldn't have been viable, apparently, given the distance the spacecraft would have ended up from Earth. And, you know, this wasn't even the first satellite rescue by Hughes. Uh, back at the start of the 90s, there was Intelsat 6, which had been launched on a Titan rocket, but the stage to boost it into its uh, geostationary transfer orbit had failed, leaving it in low Earth orbit. And so a plan was developed to rescue the spacecraft uh, with a space shuttle. And they weren't going to bring it back home. They were going to attach a new engine to it and then have it boost off into its orbit. And this was one of the most complex EVAs that has ever been performed. First of all, the crew had to capture and secure the spacecraft. And of course, most spacecraft aren't designed to be recaptured after they're launched. So they had a special rig that was supposed to be attached to it by an astronaut that was floating out on the end of the uh, arm. But uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. He was able to stop the rotation in one axis, but then caused it to start tumbling in another axis. So they called it a day and uh, left it floating in space while they came up with their the next step of their bold plan to recover this and so for the first and only time in history three crew were sent out on an EVA to secure this spacecraft it would also set a record for the longest spacewalk at the time and that wouldn't be broken until nine years later it was a uh, eight hours and 29 minutes that they spent out I think a lot of that was just spent getting in and out of the airlock which is generally designed for two astronauts rather than three. To be clear, a three-person EVA was something they had planned for, they uh, had trained for in the neutral buoyancy facility. But you, you, this whole mission is, of course, a perfect example of one of those things that only the space shuttle could do. A lot of the things the space shuttle did could have been done by other spacecraft, but this is something that was absolutely unique to the space shuttle's capabilities. They attached a new Orbis 21 uh, booster engine to it that would boost it into its GTO, and yeah, the spacecraft went and got up there, it went successfully, entered its orbit, and it was retired in 2015 and moved into a graveyard orbit. So that was a pretty long career for this spacecraft, which was initially lost. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Intelsat 29E. It launched a couple of years ago, and uh, earlier this month it had some sort of anomaly, so Exoanalytics Solutions were enlisted to check it out using their network of uh, telescopes. And yeah, it's leaking fuel and breaking up. This is not good for it. So unfortunately, it looks like there's some hardware floating around in geostationary orbit and Intelsat is going to need another satellite. So as always, I am Scott Manley and if you're a satellite in geostationary orbit, fly safe. Fly <laughs> safe.